favor be upon us. In a thousand generations, you're coming and you're going. Lord Jesus, would you have your way with us this day? We thank you that through your blood and your sacrifice, your death, burial, and resurrection, the outpouring of your spirit, you have made it possible for us to enter into your presence, to come into right relationship with you, not based on our works or our righteousness, but based on your righteousness alone. And Lord, we pray this day that we would lay hold of that truth in a fresh way, that we would understand you and your desire for relationship in a fresh way, that we would encounter you today in a way that we have not encountered you in the past. Because, Lord God, you are eternal, you are infinite, and we are finite. And by definition, there is always more to know of you, there is always more to learn of you, there is always deeper relationship to be had with you, Lord Jesus, would you break down any barriers that might be erected in our lives that would hinder us from knowing you in a deeper and fuller way this day. Lord, we pray that your presence would be made known in this place, in this people, in my heart, and in my life this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, many apologies uh, up front to anybody who's um, attempting to listen uh, or watch us online. We're having some issues with our stream this morning, so things will be, uh, recording will be posted um, as soon as possible after the service. That should be a clean recording, but but uh, our live stream is having some issues this morning, and I can only be in one place at a time. So here I am, you lucky people. No, no, I'm just kidding. I was actually at a conference one time, uh, actually he, here in town. I won't mention the church. It was a great conference. But the guy was a little nervous who got up to do to do the introduction and to welcome people before the conference, and he and he said. He meant to say, what a pleasure it is for me to be here with you. And actually what he said was, how it came out was, what a pleasure it is for you to be here with me this morning. <laughs> so it gave everybody a hearty chuckle. It was a great way to break the ice. We are on a journey through the Gospel of John. And up till now, we have entitled this journey, Essential Worship. Because roughly through the first 12 or so chapters, John has been focused on conveying to us Jesus' message and ministry of drawing people's attention to this vertical relationship that God desires to have with each and every one of us. Remember, even in, early in the stories of Nicodemus in chapter 3, he's talking about the new birth and new life in Christ with the Samaritan woman drawing her attention to the Messiah. Uh, life through the Son in chapter 5. The healing of the blind man in chapter 9. The raising of Lazarus in chapter 11. All of these things to draw people's attention, not to himself, but to the Father. Always drawing people's attention vertical to this relationship, to this encounter that he, God, desires to have with his people. And that really is, we have found, the essence of worship. Hearing God's voice and responding in faith. Last week, we felt a bit of a shift in the narrative. Did you feel that shift with the washing of the disciples' feet? Jesus demonstrates his love towards these, his best friends, and then he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you also should go and wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. That was in chapter 13. Do you feel that directional shift from this vertical perspective of this 
relationship, this encounter that God desires to have with each and every one of us, to this horizontal, horizontal shift. John here introduces a decidedly horizontal shift, and the tone of Jesus' teaching changes from sort of didactic challenges to intimate encouragement of fellowship with God the Father and one another and the Spirit, and ultimately, as we will see in the chapters to come, into the fellowship of his sufferings as he approaches the cross, spanning chapters 13 to 19, we'll see that the audience of John's writing and Jesus' ministry also changes significantly. Up in the first to up to the first 12 chapters or so, Jesus' ministry is to the masses, to the people. He teaches his disciples independently or kind of in private as well. But the majority of what we've seen so far in John is Jesus teaching to the great crowds. But now we've seen this shift. He's no longer speaking to the masses, but now he's addressing his friends, his companions, his beloved. And then in the final chapters, 20 and 21, we'll see another directional shift for his beloved after the resurrection as he calls them to engage their world with this euangelion. That's the Greek word for good news, the gospel, the proclamation of a new king on the throne. But here we are, addressing his beloved. What happens after John 21? If you just keep right on reading in your Bible, we'll see this pattern continue. Encounter, encourage, engage. It begins again in the book of Acts. Right there, the disciples encounter God in a new way through the power of the Holy Spirit. They're called together into new kingdom communities to encourage one another called Ecclesia, what we have transliterated now into English as church, to encourage one another in King Jesus. And then they too are sent out in the power of the Holy Spirit to engage their world and invite everyone to encounter this life transforming God and begin the whole cycle again for people to encounter God and encourage one another and engage their world. Today, In the 14th chapter, I'd like to highlight three things. Turn there with me, the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. We're going to highlight a place, a promise, and a person. John chapter 14. Remember, he has just told his disciples... in 13... I'm going away, and where I'm going, you can't follow. Not quite yet. And he closes that with, we open today with what we closed with last week. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Uh, Even the tone of the disciples' questions begins to shift a little bit in this chapter, especially. Up to this point, they're pretty clueless. And now we begin to see a little bit that they understand that they don't understand, right? They're not quite there yet, but at least Thomas says, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm, I clearly don't understand what you mean by what you're saying. At least he got that much. He's, he's progressed a little bit in this chapter. Well, Lord, we don't even know where you're going, so how could we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Philip said, second question in the chapter, Lord, 
show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and my Father is in me. Or at least, believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name. And I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, remember he was already gone by this time. Third question, but Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? It appears as though Jesus doesn't answer the question. We'll get into this a little bit later. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I am. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world, pardon me, uh, he has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let's leave. Lord Jesus, we pray your blessing on the reading of your word this day. Thank you, Lord, that the sure promise that you have spoken is that your word will not return void without accomplishing that for which you have sent it. And so, Lord, we pray that your word would have full sway in my heart and in my life and in our body this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So oftentimes as, as a person is uh, constructing a sermon, there's sort of blocks that you put in. And I have a block here that says, pithy illustration here. Uh, I failed to come up with a pithy illustration here, so we'll just go with that block. Imagine, if you will, a pithy illustration here. <laughs> Remember, in chapter 13, Jesus has just gotten done telling them, Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. Whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. That was 13 verse 20. And now he's beginning to unpack for them 
this one whom he is going to send. And he speaks to them of a place and a promise and a person. First, a place, beginning at the beginning of the chapter here. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. A place. Probably the most common way we in the West especially think of this place that Jesus begins describing here is a sense of a future reunion. I'm coming back and I'm going to get you. I'm going to bring you to be where I am. Loved ones that have gone before that we have lost and we long to see. Saints who have gone before, as Hebrew says, that great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, right? The famous ones uh, of church history and of scripture, the saints who have gone before. But then he also says, so you may be with me where I am. And this isn't really highlighted as one of those famous I am statements of Jesus, but I think it really applies. Think about what Jesus is saying here. I'm going to step back into time, like I'm going away now. <laughs> I'm stepping out of time again. I'm going to step back into time, and I'm going to bring you to me that you may be where I am. You one day will be pulled out of time and into eternity where I am exists. No difference in perspective of history and future and present, just I am. The eternal, ever-present one. And Jesus says, when, I'm come, when I come back to get you, that's what it's going to be. I'm going to take you out of time. And for the first time, you will see from my eternal perspective. So is it loved ones that we have lost and we long to see? Yes. Is it saints who have gone before in the cloud of witnesses? Yes. But is it much bigger than that? Yeah. For the first time, a heavenly perspective, an eternal perspective. That's the future reunion, and most of the way we think about eternity is in that light. But it's an interesting response that Jesus has to Thomas's question. Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? <clears throat> Thomas asks about going, but how did Jesus answer him? He answered him about knowing. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Is that a strange, a strange answer to a question about going? How do we know where you're going? Jesus said, I'm the way. And if you know me, you know the Father. It's, it's the word here, genosko. It means, it means an intimate knowledge or relationship with. Thomas asks about going. Jesus answers with knowing. If you really knew me, you would know my Father. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is a present reality. You do know him. From now on, you do know him. You don't have to wait <clears throat> until the future reunion. You can intimately know him now. Did you know that eternal life does not begin when you die? Eternal life begins the moment you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, your Lord, and your Messiah. And that's what Jesus is stepping into here with Thomas. Thomas, it's not about a place. It's about a present reality. It's not about a future place. It's about a present relationship that I desire to have with you. A future reunion, yes. A present reality, yes. 
But he also talks about an ultimate restoration. Verses 2 to 4, and then he picks it up again in 23. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And then in 23, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Look at this. This is in response. Oh, we'll get there. I don't want to jump ahead. Ultimate restoration. In my Father's house. This is the word oika. It means house or household or dwelling. But then he uses a different word for rooms. In my house, there are many, in my oika, there are many meno. And meno means dwelling or abode. It's kind of a funny way to put two words together. In my dwelling, there are many dwellings. A dwelling or an abode. And an abode is where you what? Abide. Keep that in mind for chapter 15 next week. That word comes up over and over and over again. In my father's house, oika, household, there are many meno, dwellings. That word that he uses here, that John uses here, meno, is used twice in Scripture. It's used once right here in verse 2. And he uses the same word in verse 23. My father will love him and will come to him. and We will come to him and make our home with him, our meno with him. And so you begin to see this interrelationship of there's a dwelling within a dwelling, among dwellings, and anticipating or awaiting an ultimate dwelling. It must have been kind of a tongue twister for Jesus as he was sharing this with them. And I can imagine the disciples going, wait, okay, so we're in you, you're in me, you're in the Father, so we're all in the Father, right? This dwelling within a dwelling. And each of you has the capacity to be a dwelling place of God through his Spirit, and so we are dwellings within a dwelling, among dwellings, and ultimately, as he says in 23, we are awaiting the final dwelling. Jesus says, in that day, we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. What does that remind you of? Any other of John's writings? Yeah, turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. See, this is a response to Judas's question. Judas says in verse 22, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Remember, He's thinking about this ultimate restoration of the nation of Israel to its own sovereignty as led by God, as they were originally in the Old Testament. That's what Judas is thinking. And Jesus sort of sidesteps and says, the ultimate restoration is not the national sovereignty of Israel, though that is a part of prophecy and will take place, But the ultimate restoration is that of God's kingdom to mankind. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
And as we read in John 21, that day is coming sooner now than ever before where God will ultimately restore all things unto himself. A place, it's a future reunion, yes. It's a present reality, yes. But it is an ultimate restoration, resetting God's original creation to how it was intended to be, a perfect creation filled with Perfect creatures, you and me, perfected in Christ, serving a perfect creator. Amen? That is the place. He also gives a promise in this passage. Verse 12, I tell you the truth. This is another one of those amen, amens that we saw last week. Truly, truly, I say to you speaking in agreement perhaps with the Father and with the Spirit. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. How's that for a promise? Things, greater things, and anything. That's quite the progression. You will do the things that I have done. What is he referring to? Is he referring to the past chapter, perhaps, where he washed the disciples' feet, he gave them the instruction to do the same, you'll do the same things I have done? Perhaps, but remember now, we've taken this shift in this chapter, and Jesus is beginning to look back on his ministry life and beginning to remind the disciples of all of the things that he had been teaching them. I think it's much bigger than just the last chapter and the washing of the disciples' feet. You will do the things that I have done. And do we see that in the life of the apostles in the book of Acts? Of course we do. Healings, raising people from the dead, right? Sickness and disease, casting out demons. You see all of these things happening in the lives of the believers in the book of Acts. The same things I have done, you shall do. Then he says greater things. Greater things. The Greek word here could mean greater in number. It could mean greater in scale. The word itself could mean better in quality. But I have a hard time believing that might be the case of what Jesus intended. Is it possible that we could do a better quality of miracle than Jesus did? I don't know. Scripture's not clear on that, but I'm not sure that's what Jesus was intending to say. How is, because what is his response? Why does he say that that is possible? Because I am going to the Father. So why can we do greater things than Jesus had done? After Jesus goes to the Father. Come, give me some give me some ideas. Right, right, because Jesus was limited in body, right? He could only be in one place at one time in his earthly ministry. But when Jesus goes to the Father, then he can pour out his Holy Spirit and he can affect kingdom change globally, all at the same time, through his people, the church equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Indeed, greater things. And then anything. We'll talk about some of these, uh, some more of this next week particularly when we're talking about the vine and fruitfulness. Uh, But anything, things, greater things, and anything. This is the promise. Ask anything in my name. And I will do it. When we align ourselves with the character and purposes of Christ, our desires reflect his desires. And so when we are asking Jesus' desire for a situation, he says, I will provide the answer. Ask anything in my name, it's a promise. 
It's a promise, probably one of the greatest promises that we fail to live into. Because I doubt. You know, what, what, what really could you have meant by it? Do you really mean if I, I... This is a tough one for me because this is one where I say, I see the promise. It is very clear. Jesus could not have been more direct in what he's saying. If you ask anything in my name, I will give it to you. There's no ambiguity there. And yet in my own life, I feel not ambiguous, but like cloudy. Well, how do I, how, how do I know when I'm in asking in your name? When we align ourselves with the purposes and the mission of Christ and his kingdom, Jesus says, I'll answer the prayer. Is this a reality for all believers or was it just the apostles? Maybe it was just the apostles. Look at verse 12. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe the evidence, that's 11, of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone, anyone who has faith, anyone who has faith, not just the 12, not just the 11 that are left, not the 12 that they'll pick up with Matthias, and no, anyone who has faith. This is just as much for you and me as it was for the disciples and apostles of his day. It's a promise. How is it possible? And it's only possible through the work of a person. And that person isn't you. And that person isn't me. That person is the Holy Spirit. Accomplishing anything for God can only be done by God's power, His Spirit at work within you. So, who is the person? A place, a promise, and now the person. Remember, we've seen a number of times where John will bookend um, a section with a similar phrase to draw attention to what? What's right in the middle. So how does he open and close this? He opens with, do not let your hearts be troubled. And he opens with this opening paragraph of verses 1 to 4. He closes the section with, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And he closes with 28 through 31. So what's right in the middle of 31 verses? Mathematicians? 16. What does 16 say? And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Another counselor. Scripture has, uh, New Testament uses two different words for another. Uh, there is the word um, hetero, which means another of a different kind. Or there is allos, which means another of the same kind. Uh, you can understand it this way. If I had a basket of apples and I picked up another apple and put it in there, that would be allos, right? It's another of the same kind. But if I picked up an orange and put it in the basket, it would be another fruit, right? A, a, one of a different kind. John uses the word here, allos, another of the same kind. And this is the bookend right in the middle. I mean, this is not the bookend in the middle. That's kind of a stupid phrase. Uh, there are bookends. This is the, the passage, the verse right in the middle of the bookends is what I'm trying to say. Don't let your hearts be troubled are the bookends. Do not be afraid. I will ask the Father. He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. What are the descriptors that we get? Look through here. What, what descriptors do we get of the Holy Spirit as Jesus is describing? Just shout them out. Helper, yeah. Spirit of truth. Remember, Jesus just said, I'm the way, the truth, right? So now we see a clear picture of how this count, this uh, spirit is another counselor. Like me, he's the spirit of truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So is he, another. Teacher, yeah. Remember in the last chapter, he said, you call me teacher and Lord. And well, you should, right? 
And now he says, of the Spirit, another of the same. Teacher. Yep. What else? Reminder, yeah. Yeah, he will be there to remind you of all the things. So teacher and reminder. So those are distinct things, right? They will, the Holy Spirit will remind you of the things that I have already taught you in my earthly ministry. And we see that kind of played out in the life of the apostles later. After he rises from the dead, there's a few times where it says, and then they remembered him that he said, right? And that's the Holy Spirit's work in their lives to remind them of what Jesus had taught them. That's why it is essential for us to be plugging uh, scripture verses into our own brains and to be communicating those to our children because what we're doing is equipping the Holy Spirit, as though he needed equipping, uh, to work in and in our lives. Because how often are you walking through life and the Holy Spirit brings up a Bible verse into your mind? You weren't thinking about it. But the Lord brings something to your mind, and it's a verse from Scripture. Whether it's applying to a prayer, a moment of prayer, or whether it's applying to a life circumstance, the, the, the verse that the Lord brings to mind through His Spirit, the reminder, that's a great one. But that's different than teacher. Teacher could be uh, things that I did not yet know, right? That's the implication of teacher. Instructing me in ways I did not yet know. Anything else that you see there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a paradox. And it, yeah, that's very true. It, later, I can't remember the passage. Uh, so, uh, there's a reference of uh, the spirit of, we were just looking at it last week, the spirit of Christ uh, is sometimes referred to. The Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. Abider? Yeah. Remind The last one. How about peace? Everything I have said to you, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Yeah. The Holy Spirit's presence in your life brings peace. God's peace. Why? Because he is peace. It's not a substance outside himself that he gives you. He gives you more of himself. Counselor, spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, teacher, reminder, peace. Now, he begins, uh, I can imagine the disciples having a quizzical look upon their face as Jesus is beginning to describe. He's made some allusions to the Spirit to come in earlier passages through the Gospels, but this is the first time he really starts unpacking what this really means and who the Holy Spirit is. And he begins to, he comforts them uh, in, I can't find it. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you. Other translations say he has been among you, with you, and he will be in you. Prepositions are important in Scripture, and there are some significant ones right here. He has been with you. You're familiar with his work. You've been hanging out with me and the power of his spirit at work in and through me. Jesus even somehow sort of hands off that authority to them as he had sent them out on their missions. And yet Jesus still refers to it as the Holy Spirit being with them. But he will be in you. When does that happen? Turn to John chapter 20. Again, Jesus says, this is verse 21, chapter 20, verse 21. This is after his resurrection, after the empty tomb, after he appears to Mary Magdalene, after he appears to his disciples, he's appearing to them now. In 21, he says, peace be with you. Sound familiar? Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them 
and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He has been with you. And he will be in you. But he doesn't stop there. This passage, uh, he continues on to other things here. But that's not the end of the work of the Holy Spirit. In this passage, we see he has been with you. In John 20, he will be in you. And then turn a couple more pages to Acts chapter 2. And he will be upon you. And it is a distinct preposition in Scripture. You know him for he lives with you. In 17, he will be in you. In chapter 20, in, that, that is um, E-I-N in Greek, into, inside of. But the word he uses in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, epi, upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. That's, he's telling them what's going to happen in verse 2 after they wait for him. And then turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, 3. They, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest. Where? In them? Among them? On them. Epi. On them. And, and uh, Luke, the writer of Acts, equates this epi upon with filling of the Spirit. There appeared to them as tongues of fire rested on them, epi, upon them, and they were all filled. We see that Greek epi is associated with filled as the culmination of this with, in, and upon relationship of the Holy Spirit with his disciples. But what does it mean to be full of the Spirit? Filled. I struggled with this word, particularly that word filled, when it came to the Greek word epi. Because filled sounds to me like inside, right? And so I always equated filled with interior. And I puzzled at how do you say the Spirit came upon them and they were filled? That was a, a paradox for me that I struggled with for a number of years as I studied through, as I sought the fullness of the Holy Spirit. What does this really mean? But full here does not denote a quantitative idea of how much, such like uh, the cup is full, or it's only half full, or it's a quarter full, but rather full implies a qualitative meaning, that it denotes a person who is dominated or controlled by the Spirit. It's not that you only got a little bit of the Spirit here, and you were a quarter full, and now, as the Spirit comes upon you, you are now epiphal, right? It is a reality, a real difference between in and upon, but it is a qualitative difference. That my entire self is being surrendered to his control. Paul this is uh, Luke writing in Acts. Paul has, speaks of it in a very similar way. Paul says, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled, <coughs> filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5.18. It literally means, be ye always being filled. Be ye always being filled. If all there ever was, was the in, what does Paul mean by be ye always being filled? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it really comes down to this idea of being controlled or empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is clear when we look at the lives of the apostles. Jesus' command in Matthew 28 is what? 
Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, what is his next instruction? Wait. Wait. Go make disciples, but wait. Why? Wait for the empowering, the epi of the Holy Spirit. He had already spoken to them in John 20, breathed on them, and they received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in them, as any believer does today, when we put our faith and trust in Christ. And then in 28, he says, make disciples, but wait. In Acts 2, he sends the Holy Spirit in a unique way, in a, in a new way in human history, upon all believers. That is the intent. It wasn't so strange uh, for them uh, how do I say this clearly? It wasn't a totally foreign concept to a Jewish mind that someone be epi upon filled with the Holy Spirit. Think about times in the Old Testament. What? The Spirit of God came upon Samson to do a mighty thing, right? Came upon Saul to prophesy. Came upon, right? So there was a number of times throughout the Old Testament we see individuals with the come upon presence of the Holy Spirit to do a a deed or to, to accomplish a task. But what was unique about the Holy, what is unique about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church age? Two things. One we see in Jesus' own baptism, when the Holy Spirit uh, descended like a dove as Jesus was being baptized, John remarks, and the Spirit remained on him. It wasn't just a one-time thing. The Spirit remained on him. That was what was so peculiar to John's description of his baptism. And the other is that now, in Acts 2, it is for all believers. Now, we see it here in the Jewish believers. We see it later in the Gentile believers. And the the church in Jerusalem had a little problem with this. And they kind of still were thinking... Hey, this is kind of our thing. We're kind of the top dog here in the religious circles, and God has a special way of dealing with us. So then when, when Peter comes back, having dealt with Cornelius, eaten in this Gentile's house, and the Holy Spirit falls upon the Gentiles, they kind of call Peter in and, to correct him and say, what are you doing hanging out with the Gentiles? And when Peter describes how the Holy Spirit fell upon, epi upon, the Gentiles, just like he did with the Jewish believers, the church in Jerusalem said, well, it's clear that God is no respecter of persons. Who are we to say that they can't receive the Spirit? If God did the act, it's open to everyone. Open to everyone. So there's a place, there's a promise, and there's a person. How do you get to this place? Jesus says, I am the way. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's one way to this place of relationship, of unity, with God the Father, and that is through Jesus the Son. He paid the penalty on the cross for your sins and for mine. He paved the way that we can enter into his holy presence through his blood. There's a place for you in his eternal purpose. There's a future hope for you to look forward to, and there's room for you in the dwelling of God if you make room in your heart for him to dwell. The promise is for you and for all believers. And there's the person, the person of the Holy Spirit.
want to encourage you today. We serve an infinite God. There is always more of Him to know. Always more of Him to understand. Always more of Him to experience. To be partakers of, as Peter says. To participate with. Can you imagine if the disciples would have heard Jesus say, the Spirit has been with you, but He will be in you. And they replied, no thanks, I'm good. I'm comfortable with the ministry that we've done for the last three and a half years. I saw Him at work in and through you. You gave me a little dose of it once in a while, and I was able to minister sort of on the side. Because He was among us, I'm good. Is that what they said? Was that their heart attitude when Jesus said, I'm going to send you another comforter? Is that the sense we get when we read? No, absolutely not. They, they were excitedly open-handed and said, there's even more? Is it possible that it could be even better than it has been? Even more. What would they have missed out on had they said, nah, I'm good? Well, maybe eternity. That's possible, right? How much more would they have missed out on? Maybe you have settled, like I did for 16 years of my life, for hanging around other spiritual people and hoping it might rub off or get me some brownie points or something. I was, I, as a pastor's kid, I did church better than any churcher could ever do church. Uh, you know, I knew every Sunday school answer. Uh, you know, I played on the worship teams as a little kid. Uh, I churched well. I was with him among his presence within his people, but he was not in me. Maybe you've settled for hanging around other spiritual people or doing churchy stuff. But Jesus is calling you today. I don't want to be in your vicinity. I want to live within you. And it just comes down to surrender. Surrendering the lordship and leadership of your life to King Jesus. Can you imagine if the apostles had heard Jesus say, make disciples of all nations, but first wait until I send the, whole, the gift of the Holy Spirit upon you, and they replied, no thanks, got this. You breathed on me, got the Holy Spirit in me, I'm good. I'll do it on my own strength, thank you very much. Got a pretty good idea how you did it the last three and a half years. Like, can, you, can you imagine them saying that? No. Oh. Again, they're open-handed. He told us to wait, so we're going to wait, and we're going to pray, and we're just going to wait for whatever. They didn't even know what the gift was exactly that, that Jesus was going to send. He just said, wait. And so they agreed. All right, we're going to wait. We're going to wait for the gift of the Spirit to be poured out. The book of Acts. How would that have turned out had they declined the offer? The book of Acts would have been much, much shorter. Uh, let's just say that, right? Why? Because the entire book of Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles. It's the Act of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. And had they declined, there would be no book of Acts. There would be no New Testament church as we see them being established in the book of Acts. Because we can't accomplish God's purposes in the flesh. Is it possible that you have settled for less 
than what the Lord would have for you to be growing in today? That's my question. Is it possible that there's more of an infinite God available to us as finite creatures? Were the disciples offended in John 14 or John 20 or in Acts 1 that Jesus explained there's more available to you? Were they offended by that? No, no. They, under, they said they were eager to have more of him. I want to know more. I want to understand more. I want to experience you in a deeper way. I want to partake of your presence and power through the Holy Spirit in a way that I have not yet known. Is that your heart? That's my heart. It's my heart for me personally. It's my heart. It's my heart for my family and my kids. That they not only know the stories of the Bible, but they, they know the God of the Bible within them, and the empowerment of the Spirit upon them to accomplish the things that He has set out for them in their lives. Don't settle for what you've always known. There's always more of an infinite God to encounter. close with this Luke chapter 11 if the worship team wants to make their way up we'll close with this Luke chapter 11 verse 13 back up to 11 which of you fathers if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Jesus makes it clear, both here in Luke and in the Gospel of John, that the Spirit of God is available to us all. He has been with you. When you put your faith and trust in Him, He comes to live and dwell within you. And there is the blessing of His presence upon you to live a holy life, to walk in the power of His Spirit, to accomplish what He has called for you in your life in this season. And I would just invite you to pray with me. This is my prayer. Lord, that I want to go deeper with you. I don't want to shut myself off and say, I know everything there is to know. I've got everything there is to get. I somehow believe that this finite earthen vessel can contain all of the infinite God. Lord, may we see ourselves as a cup, not just full of water of your spirit at salvation but a cup totally submerged in the ocean is there water in the cup yes does the cup contain all of the ocean by no means and lord i just want to be open for you to bring anything into my vessel as you see fit that your spirit would come in power in my life. In the life, in my marriage, in my family, in my children. 
in our church. Lord God, would you move by the power of your spirit among us? that we be more than just saved and heading to heaven when we die, but that we would be an unstoppable force for the kingdom of Christ in this place, in my neighborhood, in my workplace. For your kingdom's sake, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done in my heart as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord, that you are a good, good father and you give good gifts to your children. In Jesus' name.